All right. Hi, my name is Ross Tafari Kenny II. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this conference session titled Supporting Clusters of Diverse, Small, Independent Retailers Coming Out of COVID. With presenters Todd Marshall Folly King from MNC PPC's Park and Rex and Bobby Boone and Axis. This session was pre recorded for the start of the Vive virtual conference and is made available to view on demand during or after the chapter conference that runs from November 15th to 17th, 2021. ASCP planners may claim 0.25 credits, CM credits for viewing this session and for those and everyone else. I hope you enjoy it. Now I'll hand it off to Todd Folly King, and you know, thank you for the work on making this conference happen. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, learn about our project today, um, where we were evaluating tools to support small independent retailers in minority and migrant communities as we were dealing with the effects of the pandemic. I'm Todd Folly King, the real estate specialist from Montgomery County, and I'm joined today by the founder of And Access, Bobby Boone, who led the consultant team that spearheaded the great work we're going to share today. This first quote here reflects um, a good amount of the feedback we received from the business that we engaged with. The, the few resources that we do have are not particularly well targeted to support the smallest retailers. Um, we classify micro businesses, you know, businesses with less than you know, five people with much, much larger, smaller businesses. And the result is that those, those, those smallest retailers had, had many of them just given up on securing the resources we offer um, because they just didn't feel that they were ever gonna, gonna win in that competition. And it, it, it had them at a, at a disadvantage even before the pandemic started. The slide here shows the components that go into the definition we're using for diverse retail. Independent small retail stores that are owned by or predominantly serving minority and or migrant communities. And you can see some of the, the demographics, the categories that, that we were considering here. Um, and one thing I'll say is that, you know, we as a county knew that we were very diverse. Um, it's why we started this, this project to begin with. Um, but one of the really pleasant findings from the study was that the clusters we were focusing on were even more diverse than we realized. That, that many of the stores within them that did not have obvious external signals catering to minority and migrant clientele were in fact minority owned. And you know, we learned that because of the great work that Bobby and his team did visiting just about every store in each cluster and, and, and categorizing them and figuring out you know, who's owning them, who are they serving, um, what's the role that they're playing in this cluster. Um, so it was, it, was, it was very labor intensive to do, but produced great data for us. I'll say especially. <laughs> The map here shows the, the three study areas. Um, we were looking at Wheaton, Silver Spring, and Tacoma Langley. And we chose these because, of course, they are centers of migrant communities, um, and, they're, and they're sort of the commercial hub of those neighborhoods. There are also areas where there are some um, development and displacement pressures. The Silver Spring and Tacoma Langley, the purple line, of course, is being built. And in Wheaton, there has been an, an effort at revitalization there for, for a while. Um, and while you know, we are looking to concentrate development in you know, high amenity transit served areas like these, we also recognize that the existing retailers in those clusters um, really help contribute to the quality of life that we enjoy and what makes Montgomery County what it is. And so you know, it's looking to how do we accommodate growth, but also how do we strengthen the cluster that is there so that it's not displaced by, by development pressures. Um, the study is an extension of a, of a prior study we did in 2019 with a class of students from the University of Maryland, um, looking at how we might strengthen the cluster small retail at the, the Long Branch neighborhood. And that study, which, which Bobby actually led the class um, or was the, their advisor, they identified many of the tools and the, the study that we did this as a follow-up, we got to go into greater depth as to how might we apply them and implement them and what are the various trade-offs between using them and some of our other objectives um, in these areas. I'll now pass it off to Bobby to, to start to walk through what we found. All righty. Um, so uh, just checking sound, is it okay? Or is it muffled? 
Great. <laughs> Sorry about that recording. Um, so just uh, to kick us off, um, you know, one of the things that we wanted to uh, really understand is quantitatively what we're talking about. You know, who are those business owners? How many people do they employ? What's their estimated sales? Their the estimated square footage of those um, spaces, et cetera. And so, you know, through, you know, on the ground work, we were able to create an inventory of these businesses and really understanding, you know, what, how they contribute to each of the clusters. Um, one of the things that you want to really point out is like diverse retailers are a sizable portion, you know, ranging from 33 to 46 percent of total share of, of retailers in the community, as well as they account for a really large number of jobs and sales. Um, so thinking about, you know, these figures and really looking, you know, specifically at this Tacoma Langley Crossroads, where many of those establishments are even occupying larger spaces that historically can uh, or typically are occupied by um, larger national brands, you see that that even equates um, through to a uh, larger amount of estimated sales. Next slide. In addition, you know, there are many qualitative benefits that we um, identified through this work, you know, diverse retailers are known to serve as social fabrics in their communities. Um, they fill specific retail needs, um, you know, that are culturally appropriate, you know, thinking about you know, beauty supply stores or, um, you know, local grocers with specialized products, et cetera. We talked to many of those. You know, they also are opportunities for jobs for um, first-time immigrants, um, as well as they provide wealth opportunities. Um, so, you know, these first-time immigrants typically, they, you know, in Adams Morgan community I live in, there's a Turkish restaurant. Most of their employees are, you know, first-generation immigrants, and they provide, you know, an opportunity for that wealth generation, you know, specifically coming from a different, um, economic status um, from where they originated. And then, you know, thinking about also this vitality and authenticity um, that each of these districts uh, create, um, it really makes a neighborhood that's, you know, you're interested in going to that, you know, is not a lot of the same store typologies, you know, you can try, you know, new cuisines or new products and really be able to identify um, culturally, you know, what this community offers. Um, and so, you know, as Silver Spring, large, large amount of Ethiopian American businesses are clustered um, within the Fitton Village neighborhood there and understanding, hey, this is actually a unique selling product proposition um, for the community. And, you know, you can have some of the best food, some of the best times, you know, even club owners, et cetera, um, that all like fall within that um, category. And so really bringing out these opportunities is um, something that's a part of the qualitative findings. Next slide. I, I just add to what you said there, Bobby, in that this is really how we've been trying to sell the, the, the tools to implement um, because you know none of the tools are resource free to the county. They all require some dedication, some time, effort, and money. Um, and so trying to help our, our, our leaders understand just how essential these retailers are to the community. Because as you saw in the prior slide, you know, they're not large. It's not, they're not, they're not big stores. It's not a huge portion of our economy, but the qualitative aspect is enormous. And I will say, you know, we're doing the downtown Silver Spring plan right now. And every single person we talk to about what do you like about Silver Spring, just about everyone says the diverse retailers. I love the mix of small shops that, that makes Silver Spring what it is. And I wanna see that stay, I wanna see that grow. I don't wanna see it just become a landscape of chain stores. And what they're talking about, whether they know it or not, they're really talking about our diverse retailers um, and, and noting that that is what gives that entire neighborhood its character. Um, and I think, you know, I think we have had some success in, in making that clear to our leaders that, you know, the, the qualitative aspects are enormous and, and really merit us devoting resources to, to strengthening these clusters. So, you know, I think ultimately, you know, through all of the changes that are occurring through the neighborhood, dealing with COVID, the uh, new development pressures coming in, whether that's from Purple Line or private investment, et cetera, it's really, you know, critical to understand like, hey, these, 
this could actually contribute to Montgomery County losing its diverse retailers. Um, you know, within that, we really tried to drill down through interviews um, with each of the business, either managers or owners, to what does that mean? Um, so we identified four overarching categories, technical assistance and business networks, public policy and public investment, real estate and capital and financing. And then you see like under that, there's so many, so many categories that really um, identify, you know, how businesses are perceiving their challenges. And so, you know, these challenges are, are real and also are corroborated through interviews with other um, business support organizations, et cetera. Um, you know, highlighting this limited staff um, capacity as a primary variable, um, really understanding that there are so many businesses, you know, we identified um, in these clusters alone, not counting the entire county and how, you know, there are limited staff um, at the county who are assigned to those um, businesses. And then under real estate, you know, this risk of displacement, um, I think that's really critical um, to the understanding. And if you can just go to the next slide, this quote here, really starts to identify why, you know, it's not just the businesses who are at risk, it's their customers. And so if the businesses lose their customers, you know, and they're appealing to that customer base, you know, what's their real um, financial viability long-term, you know, they yes, they may be able to sustain a little bit longer um, and customers will travel to get those goods and services from them. However, you know, those shopping patterns in turn change, you know, new competitors may be um, open in these, uh, the new neighborhoods in which they um, occupy, et cetera. So, you know, it goes without mentioning that there's a need for housing policy that really complements the business um, strategy. Next slide. And so, you know, what are these strategies? Um, we identified four overarching um, categories for them. Coordination, which really talks about, you know, how do you support them with your more staff resources, capital, which is financial resources, controls, or the regulatory uh, environment. And then the community is, you know, what are the um, wraparound programming and policies that really contributes to, you know, the placemaking, et cetera, within um, each of the districts. And next slide. And what we identified through those um, were nine different tools um, that really are applicable to either the county as a whole or each of the communities. And that's why they rose to the top, right? It's like, if we're able to identify tools that can support the entire county, that's great. Um, and cause you know, they're minority owned businesses um, outside of these clusters, but there, it's also great because you end up getting to this level of equity um, that you know can be attributed um, from you know, hey, minority business designations that really can support you know identifying who those businesses are and then preparing different tools with it, such as you know loan pools that they're eligible for um, or small business impact policies that you know really supports. Um, you know, their long-term preservation and understanding, hey, is there opportunities for um, the county to play a role in communicating, you know, hey, this development's coming down the pipeline. This is how it's gonna impact you. How can we mitigate that impact before it's just like, hey, we're here, we're about to put a, a sign that says construction, but store is still open. So being much more artful in these things. And Todd's gonna to go through two of the primary tools in which we uh, mentioned diverse retail liaison as well as the commercial overlay zone. Thank you, Bobby. And I'll say all of these tools are detailed in the report that, that we put out, which is on our website, um, goes into detail of the, the challenges and, and these tools. Um, we chose to highlight these tools, starting with the diverse retail liaison, because we cannot do more if we do not provide additional capacity to work with the small retailers. Um, the current office that supports them are their saints. They work incredibly long hours and are incredibly devoted. But I believe that, that you know, it, it's a handful of people for a county of 1 million plus um, and you know, you can see the number of small retailers we had, and diverse retailers we had in, in just those three clusters. And there is just no way for that office to meet the incredible demand that's put on them. Um, and we we also have a strong network of 
civic organizations that are working with diverse retailers, and they too are completely overwhelmed by the need. Uh, and so we we could not come out with a report recommending additional tools and frankly additional work for this office to take on if we did not give them more capacity. And so this idea here is to have a dedicated staff person for each cluster whose job is to be out there on the streets, making relationships, making connections, helping store owners address the, the challenges they're facing and connecting them to resources in the county, um, civic organizations, other partnerships that we might be able to leverage. And when we did this, it was in the middle of the pandemic and there was substantial concern about the, the future budget for the county and that, that influenced how we framed the recommendation. So at its essence, um, you know, it makes clear that there's just no substitute for the time and investment needed to create a relationship with a small, with a, with a diverse retailer in order to, you know, have a chance of connecting them with the services they need when a crisis like the pandemic comes along or, or even in normal times. Um, but we, we did suggest that this may be a partnership between the county and a, a mission-oriented nonprofit that, that works with these small businesses in order to, you know, make the, the county investment go really as far as it can. Um, but, you know, we, we present this one first every time to make clear, you know, there, there's no silver bullet, there's no, there's no easy way to work with small retailers and diverse retailers without having staff on the street. Um, and, and it's definitely the case for Montgomery County that, that to do more, we, we just need more people. The second tool that we want to, to present is the overlay zone. And, and this, this is one that, that gets more into the land use that you know, those of us in the planning department have more control over. Uh, and it would ensure that new development provides small retail spaces that in being smaller are less expensive to fit out and, and have a lower total cost of, of rent. And we emphasize the need for this tool in Tacoma Langley because um, that's comprised of, of just a few large shopping centers uh, and they're they're owned by companies that do development. So redevelopment of any one of those centers could you know wipe out or displace a significant portion of that cluster um, really at, at any time that that the market you know calls for new type of development. And so it's really important that in that area um, we get an overlay in place that requires any new development that comes along to provide some of these smaller retail bays. Uh, we did examine but ended up not recommending a commercial inclusionary zoning requirement. And a, a CIZ you know, works like uh, inclusionary zoning for residential. Um, it requires that new development provide dedicated affordable commercial space. We ended up not recommending it after considerable discussion um, because we found it made it too difficult to attain the other goals we have for attracting growth to the Purple Line Corridor where we will have you know, high quality transit. Um, and that we didn't have very many tools to offset the, the, the impact of that requirement to future project feasibility. Um, so instead, we focused in on how do we create smaller spaces. And we are currently implementing this recommendation uh, in the, the downtown Silver Spring plan that's being developed right now. Um, there's a recommendation in, in the drafts of that plan at this stage that the Fenton Village overlay zone be amended to require new development above a certain threshold, include small retail spaces of 2,000 square feet or smaller, that would be easier for a diverse retailer to, to rent out because it would be less costly than a much bigger space, and also a lot less costly to, to fit out, you know, to turn from a concrete shell into a, into a store. So this quote here, I think, reflects the essence of the challenge we face. Um, Montgomery County has services and programs available and, and really amazing staff that work with small businesses, but diverse retailers have difficulty accessing those uh, resources and, and, and staff because they don't know if they're available. And we have limited capacity to promote them in the way that, that, that we need to. Um, it also reflects how our assistance really occurs at the margin. You know, we're not going to be able to save every diverse retailer who's struggling. Um, and municipal support is, is inherently small compared to just the magnitude of what you face when you're running a business. Uh, and, and as a result, you know, it's, it's especially critical that, that those supports that we are able to provide and that we do have are really targeted and reach their intended audiences um, or their intended recipients, excuse me. And that, and that really is what that suite of tools, when you put them all together, is aiming to do. 
to increase the amount of resources available and ensure that they're getting to diverse retailers. With one that, thing, I, yeah, I was gonna say one thing, I was on mute, you know, still haven't learned that. Um, one thing I wanted to say about CIZ uh, to be additive around the framework of, you know, why it couldn't work, you know, in affordable housing, there are so many different subsidies that are provided in order to fill the gap um, for, you know, developers and make the uh, viable project and commercial that doesn't exist, um, you know, in, in most instances, unless a local municipality has created such program. Um, and so thinking about, you know, strategies in the future that, you know, could support Montgomery County and, and this conversation or others really relies on that financial um, subsidy and really thinking about, you know, overarching what what's needed for, you know, these smaller spaces, you know, that's a trend that's happening in retail in general, you know, a national brand or local brand agnostic. And so thinking really about, you know, what are the frameworks that you know, can contribute to um, it being a desirable place for small businesses, as well as being able to, for those small businesses to compete for space alongside national brands. And that, often still relies on certain financial structures to be in place that does not exclude you know, people that aren't credit uh, appropriate, um, good credit tenants, et cetera, that you know, often come into the conversation. So with that, I'll, I can turn back over to thank you, but didn't want to let that uh, be left out of the conversation. That, that's actually a great point, Bobby. And I think it, it, it flows right into sort of the concluding statement, which is that, you know, throughout this, this, this presentation, everything is leading up to this point that it, it's immensely labor intensive and resource intensive to provide meaningful support to diverse retailers and small retailers. Um, and I think we identified the immense value these retailers provide to the identity of our county and the quality of life in our region, you know, to showcase why that is worth that large and sustained investment. Um, but, but it is precisely that, you know, it, it is a, a decision that we are going to dedicate resources because this makes our quality of life what it is in this county, and, and, and we should thus do it. Um, so I want to thank you for your time today, and we, we greatly hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can I stop recording now?